Hello everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday the 4th of February. Today's topic is 10 Tips for Formative Assessment with Technology, Meaningful, Sustainable, and Scalable, hashtag Formative Tech. And your, our special guest is Monica Burns. Your show hosts are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffitt, Tammy Moore, and Paula Noggle. Thanks to Tammy for doing the closed captioning for us. And I'm going to turn the mic over to Kim, who will introduce Monica and ask her the newbie question. Okay, good morning. First off, kudos to everybody from around the world, don't get to say that very often, for taking time out of your weekend to share or to take the time to learn learn about what Monica is going to share and it is going to be awesome. Before I do the introduction, I do want to remind you in the archives you will find a webinar that I was fortunate enough to do with some teachers from the Madison School District in Phoenix and it was about assessments. That's pretty much a passion of mine. And so you can find all of them in the supplemental resources from the Live Finder and the show was on 11-7-15 and it's under the yellow tab in today's Live Finder. It is an absolute honor to be able to present Monica Burns. Monica, Dr. Dr. Monica Burns is an ed tech consultant, author, Apple distinguished educator, and founder of ClassTechTips.com, one of my favorite resources. Monica has presented to teachers and administrators and tech enthusiasts at numerous national and international conferences, including the South by Southwest EDU, ISTE is where I've got to see her, and ed tech, EDU Tech. She is a webinar host for the Simple K-12 and a regular contributor to Edutopia. Gee, I wonder what she does in her spare time. Monica is the author of Deeper <laughs> Learning with QR Codes and Augmented Realities, one of my favorite books. I know because I've got it tagged all over the place. Um, a Scannable Solution for Your Classroom, and Formative Tech, Meaningful, Sustainable, and Scannable Formative Assessments with Technology. Monica visits schools across the country to work with pre-K through 12 teachers to make technology integration exciting and accessible. And like we do with all of our guests, we ask a question. So, Monica, um, what is the difference between formative and summative assessment, and how do you decide which to use and when? Well, thank you so much for having me uh, this morning to talk about some things that I'm really passionate about. And we can jump right in with this difference between formative and summative assessment. So formative assessment is our check for understanding that happens before, during, after a lesson and gives us information that we can use right away or pretty quickly um, to make instructional decisions. When we think about summative assessment, we're thinking more of the end of year, end of unit, kind of big picture data that's used often at a state or district, even a national level, to make some major decisions about how things are going um, when it comes to looking in a large fashion um, and those big trends as opposed to the information that teachers will use on the ground um, every day to make decisions for their students. So when we talk about formative assessment today, we're talking about the checking for under understanding in real time so that we can figure out who's got it, who needs some extra help, who's ready to move on, and really make some decisions about the direction of everyday lessons as well as um, long-term units and multi-lesson um, explorations with different content. So am I good to jump in right now? I don't want to move in uh, too quick without the, the thumbs up. Okay, great. Well, today we're going to talk about 10 tips for formative assessment with technology. And just to share a little bit again about my background, um, I'm based here in the New York, New Jersey area, although I'm on the road a lot. I just got in last night from a week in North Carolina working with teachers and we'll be heading out to Austin next week um, for TCEA to, to talk about some of these topics I'm passionate about. Um, but as a classroom teacher in a one-to-one -one iPad classroom um, in New York City, I spent a lot of time thinking about how we were using the devices that we were lucky enough to have in our students' hands um, over the course of the school day. 
And I've grown a lot um, in my understanding and my practice of what it means to check in and, and really see where students are over the course of a day. And so when we talk today about um, these 10 tips for formative assessment, we're really thinking about how we can take um, the technology resources, whether it's one teacher's smartphone or lots of devices, one in the hands of, of all different students, um, to really have a better understanding of where students are at so that we can make decisions based on information that we've gathered, because that's really what formative assessment is all about, and it's happening all the time. You know, as you look around a classroom, as you peek over the shoulder of students, as you listen into conversations and talk one-on-one, -on -one, you're formatively assessing students. You're realizing what's going on, who's making meaning of a mini lesson or that hands-on activity, and who's going to need a little bit more support. So when we talk about formative assessment, these are the things that are already happening naturally, no matter what label you're putting on it or how many checklists you have attached to different clipboards around your classroom. But what I want to talk to you about today is how you can really use technology to take this to the next level um, in a couple different ways. So I have a link for us for today with the resources that I'm going to share, and there's the awesome Live Binders page, too, um, that was pushed out earlier. So my website, classtechtips.com, has lots of stuff to search from, years and years worth of posts now at this point. But if you go to backslash webinar, you'll see some special links of the tools I shared today. You'll even see a Google form, which is one of my favorite formative assessment tools, um, where you can put in your information, and when I kick off my February raffle, um, later this week, you'll be entered into there automatically if, if you so choose. So we're going to get started with this idea of meaningful, sustainable, and scalable formative assessment. And so my new book for Corwin um, comes out at the end of March. It just went up live with a, a nice bright cover on Amazon uh, just in the past few days. So really excited to share um, to share this. You all here who are tuning in live or, or maybe watching a little bit later on or some of the first to get a peek at this, at the cover at least. Um, so I'm really excited to talk about how you can use technology tools in a way that is really meaningful, in a way that is sustainable, in a way that is scalable. So when I use those three words, right, we're talking about doing things with a sense of purpose because you're going off searching for answers to questions, not answers to questions like, can you put in the answer to a multiple choice question necessarily, but answers to our own questions, right? Do students really understand what we've taught? Do they have an interest already in this topic? Is there a baseline that I can then work off of? All the sort of things we'll talk about today. And then sustainable. So the idea that is this a practice that is just a one-off every once in a while? Is it something I can embed into my instruction on a regular basis? And what I talk so much about in the book and will touch upon today is really finding that comfort level of what's going to work best for you. So is this something that um, is going to work with your teaching style, your daily practice, and the needs of your students in a way that is sustainable over the course of the school year. So really picking and choosing those moments where you can use technology to elevate the way you're checking for understanding. And then we'll talk about um, scalable as well. So when you start doing this work in your classroom, right, do you have that person in your building, that person that you're connected to online, like so many of the connections here today, to really think about um, bringing this to the next level in terms of school-wide, um, school year-long <laughs> um, adoption of formative assessment tools. So as we jump into my 10 tips today, I want you to feel good that there's going to be something for everyone. So if you are working in one-to-one -one Chromebooks, if you have a card of iPads that you share and you can use every Tuesday, if you have one iPad that you brought in from home or even just a smartphone in your pocket, you know, there's a lot that can happen with a range of technology. And so as an Apple Distinguished Educator, coming from a one-to-one -one iPad classroom, um, I'm very often in that mindset, right? I have my iPad hat on, sometimes I say to people. Um, but more and more now, when I go out to schools and do a lot of on-the-ground training or, or speaking at district events, you know, what I'm always trying to do is, is to share something that's going to work for everyone, right? In that BYOD environment, that bring your own device, something that's device neutral or device agnostic, whichever term you use to describe it. So we're going to jump into the tips today and I'll kind of go back and forth and share you some things that are great for um, environments with, with lots of different technologies. 
So the first tip for today is all about finding the baseline. So one of the quickest, easiest things to do with technology tools, whether you are signing out that iPad cart for one day or have your kids open up um, a web browser on their Chromebook, is to find the baseline. So what is it that your students already know about a topic? And can you check in and, and figure that out right away? And so when you find the baseline with technology, you're not having a couple students raise their hand to tell you what they already know, right? You're getting a window into the th process of students. And you'll hear me use that window into thinking um, a lot today, right? So the idea here is that you can get a feel for where students are already at. And when you do something like a KWL, you know, what you're doing, and you see here Padlet, one of my favorite tools um, that's featured in the book too. Um, Padlet is a favorite where you can have students on their individual device or maybe partnered up with another child, right, leaning over together and saying, what do we already know about the solar system? They can post on this collaborative board and you can have that up on display maybe in the smart board or interactive board in your classroom, and you can get a picture into what everyone already knows. And what's so important about this is that when you do a KWL, right, what do you already know? What do you want to know? You're gathering so much information, which is really what formative assessment is all about, right? Getting that information to figure out where students are so you can make decisions. So if you notice that students are posting things about the solar system that are right on point and now you're realizing, oh wow, they went to the planetarium last year, I can use that um, when we talk about it this year. Or if students are saying things such as, you know, that are just a little off base, if you will, right? Well now you can know what those misconceptions are and you can use that and address those misconceptions over the course of subsequent lessons. So Padlet is great. It works on all different devices. You just have to open up a web browser. The way you see it used here, I'm using it totally free. Um, there's other layers to it. Um, we're just scratching the surface with some of the tools I share with you. Um, but this is a way for you to get a baseline, right? Find the baseline in your class so that you know not just where individual students are, but as a group, what are some things that you're going to have to address as you move into a new unit of study? The second tip is to gauge interest. Figuring out what your students are excited about is a really important way to um, find a pathway for daily lessons um, or for a long unit. So if you know that kids are really excited about um, the topic that's been popular in a new Disney movie or it's about to be the Winter Olympics, right? What are they pumped up about? Because when you find out that information, you can then use that information to form your lessons. And so knowing that students are interested and excited in a topic is an important part of information to gather. And you might already have interest surveys in the beginning of the year, but in the beginning of different units, you know, beyond just grouping students because they're excited about the same thing, you know, this is the information you'll use when you form examples for your class. When you pick out that high interest text or you choose a read aloud, um, if you know your kids are excited about something, they're going to, that buy-in is already going to be there. And so one of my favorite tools for gauging interest is a polling tool that I love called Kahoot. So if you know that your students you know, that you're studying um, weather systems or natural disasters in your class, right? You can have a Kahoot where you have kids, you know, vote, right? Um, this is such a easy to use tool. Um, it's actually, you know, something that's used with students who might not be um, independent readers too, because there's a color coding and you can you know, read out the responses and kids are on their device. Um, this is something where your information now that you want is what are kids excited about? And when you're able to gauge interest quickly and easily with a digital tool, right, this brings that together. And so, of course, you could have kids raise their hand or thumbs up, thumbs in the middle, thumbs down. But we all know how our students are, and we're like that as adults, too. Right? When we turn to, you know, give our response, you know, we're immediately looking to see 
who else has a finger of five, fist of five, or four fingers up, or three fingers up, whatever it might be. So by using digital tools, we're able to get a um, more accurate picture of where kids are at that isn't necessarily influenced by their peers, um, and then we can use that information to really be strategic. And so all of the resources as I kind of go through this list, I put links up at that classtechtips.com slash webinar, but you'll also find it into the, um, you also find it in the live finders for today too. So the third tip I want to share is about back channels. And I have to tell you, I have been so excited about back channels. Um, I was at FETC um, last week, I guess, already, <laughs> or two weeks ago now, and down in Florida, um, presenting on formative tech to teachers. And um, it was really neat because I happened to be right nearby the Brain Pop folks um, in this big kind of sharing session. And one of the reasons that was great is because Brain Pop, which is a video tool, is an awesome example of back channels in action. So what is a back channel? Well, a back channel is what happens online um, during a live event or discussion, right? So if you are, you know, like me and you're going to carve out some time this weekend for football, um, you might go on to Twitter and follow a hashtag, right, for the event. So follow a hashtag, you know, hashtag Super Bowl or hashtag Patriots, or hashtag um, Tom Brady, right? And so you have those hashtags that you're following because you want to see what are other people tweeting about? What are they talking about um, when this event is happening? So there's plenty of live events happening in your classroom, right? And that example of brain pop might just be one of them. So what you might have is you might have a brain pop video playing and you pause you know, every 30 seconds or every minute or so and have kids respond to a prompt or have kids um, put in um, a question that they have. And one of my favorite tools for this is today's Meet. I kind of think of it as, and it is free, um, and I kind of think of it as a tool that um, just models a social media feed, right? So what happens is students open up the Today's Meet classroom that you've um, started, and when they open up this web browser, they start off by putting in their name. If you're feeling already like, oh no, I don't want to send my kids off to, you know, put in their name in this back channel. What if they put in someone else's name? What if they write something I don't love, right, in this kind of live space? Um, this is one that you um, can have kids partner up on really easily, right? So say you have a class at a Chromebook, um, even if you have one for everyone, have the kids partner up, um, turn and talk to one another, and then put their response in together, right? So it might be, um, Monica and Peggy put their name in together, and then their message um, goes in 140 characters. So a back channel is great because it gives kids a space to talk through, post ideas. You get to listen in on uh, the conversations your students are having. The students who might not raise their hand um, to participate or ask a question can post that question in here. Um, kids can bounce off one another's um, answers or you can put this up on the smart board too. So it really just depends on you know, how you want to use this with your kids. Um, giving them a lot of guidance is a great way to start, right? Everyone type in a response to this prompt, and then you might kind of loosen those controls. If you are teaching a digital citizenship curriculum, this is an awesome connection to your curriculum goals too, because you can have students um, really talk about what kind of comments are appropriate, what kind of comments are relevant or productive, and just build off some of the conversations you've had in um, a digital citizenship class or, or exploration. Today's meet is totally free. You have to set it up for um, however long you want the room to be open for. And what you can do is that then you as a teacher can download all of the um, responses like into a PDF or something. Great if you are, are looking to have some like hard data collection, you can go back in and really take a look and say, wow, you know, what am I looking for when it comes to formatively assessing my students? I'm looking to see if they're using our domain specific vocabulary words. I can read through that transcript, see who is just doing an awesome job of that and who needs a little bit more support. So like for all of the things we're talking about today, it really comes down to what your learning objective and your goals are, right? What is it that you're looking for? Um, when you give kids these activities, you're on the hunt for information that you can then use to bring back into your conversation um, that you have with students one-on-one, -on -one, as well as your kind of larger instructional plan too. Our fourth one is pull the class. And so similarly to gauging um, kids' interest, 
when you pull the room, you're getting a quick understanding of where everyone's at. So yes, your goals might be the same as um, a baseline or as seeing who's excited about what. But what's great about um, just pulling the class is you get an easy read of the room. And so the tools I shared already are ones where you probably need a device or two um, among your students. Maybe they're partnered up on one device or they have one on one. Um, one that I love that's great if you really just have that smartphone in your pocket um, and your kids, you're feeling like you're in a low tech classroom or you're really passionate about technology but you just don't have the resources in your building, um, this is Plickers. And Plickers is awesome. It's been around for a while. Um, you've probably um, thought a little, you know, probably heard about it before if you um, are a fan of QR codes and scannable technology like I am. And I appreciate the shout out um, on my book on QR codes. Um, that's uh, still up and available on Amazon there too and, and something I'll, I'll be sharing actually at TCEA next week as well. Um, but what's great from a formative tech perspective um, is that you have um, cards that have a particular um, code on it. Um, students will have one of these codes in front of them. They hold them up to give their response. Um, and then you hold up your smartphone and you kind of scan the room um, and you see um, what the responses are connected to the students. It is something that you have to really plan for as opposed to say opening up a web browser and pushing it out and being good to go. Um, and what you can do is you can get cards. And I'm so excited I just saw it pop up in the chat about those um, pre-made clickers. I was just talking to someone about this last week about how those cards are, are like good to go and laminated the right kind of way and, and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, Plickers is great if you are kind of low tech in terms of what you have access to, but are looking to kind of read the room literally and check for understanding with that too. So there are a couple of tools that I'm really excited about for this number five, which is um, listen to voices. And so when you are using technology tools for formative assessment, you can do some things that you just could not do without technology, right? These digital tools can give you um, a window into students' thinking in a way that just would not be possible from a logistical perspective, um, the ability to have a you know, meaningful 30-second conversation with each one of your students in your class um, is just really tough over the course of you know, a lesson. Like, how do you know for sure that they've got this? You know, it's one thing if your students are um, submitting a couple multiple choice questions when they are answering, say, a, a math question or, you know, figure out what the answer is when you add these fractions. And yeah, like you definitely could get some great information from kids filling out a Google form with that, but it's very different if you get to hear them for 30 seconds telling you the difference between a numerator and a denominator, right? So if you can listen to the student's voices, you just get so much more information. And one of my favorite tools for doing this um, that has just been really adopted in so many schools. I have to tell you, I was in a school this week that I had been in in November. We kind of talked about Seesaw. I came back here um, last to their school last week and was just so excited to see it all over the place really using this awesome tool. Now, Seesaw can be used in iPad-friendly environments, web-friendly environments, totally depends. And what Seesaw does is it gives students an opportunity to upload work from their class. So this could be a snapshot of an activity that they've done on paper, um, or it could be something where they are simply drawing a picture, recording their voice, and sending it to you. And so when you're listening into student voices, right, you're on a fact-finding mission. What is it that you want to know if they've mastered, right? So it might come back to that fraction example, right? You want to know if they can convert between numerators or between denominators, unlike denominators, <laughs> excuse me. Um, and so you want to know for sure that they can do this. Well, if you look at those multiple choice answers, you kind of have a, all right, three out of four, you know, not so bad. Looks like we're on the right path. But what information is that really giving you in terms of what individual students need or trends that you see in your class, right? You want to make sure that you have a full picture and tools that record um, your audio or even video will give you uh, a lot of information and it can be one of those things where you really are just listening in for you know 20 seconds or so um, and getting a, a full picture of who needs what, who's mastered this um, as well. What's 
especially useful when it comes to these um, voice tools is that your students who might struggle to read a multiple choice question and give you an answer or write a response, whether that's for um, language acquisition reasons or a, a wide range, um, this gives you a full picture into, into their understanding um, that just might not happen when it comes to reading and responding or, or writing something. Another tool that I'm super excited about and I shared with teachers in New York and New Jersey earlier this month is Recap. It's from the folks at Swivel and what Recap does is similar to, similar in a, in a way to Seesaw, a different platform entirely, but um, some similarities in the sense that you are having kids um, respond with, with audio and video um, responses to questions that you give. So really comes back to that kind of tip number five of listening to the voices of students. Another thing that I'm excited about when it comes to um, checking for understanding with technology tools is using screencasts. Now, screenshots are when you take a picture of what's happening. I know I'm constantly picking up my phone and just taking a screenshot by accident because I've touched the buttons in the wrong way. I'm sure it's happened to you too. Um, but a screenshot is great because it grabs a picture of your screen, but a screencast is a video recording. And so what you can do with a video recording, like a screencast, is you can watch a pathway of learning for your students. So following them on their journey as they solve a problem or share a diagram. And so there are some fantastic screencasting tools. Explain Everything is definitely a favorite. Um, the creator of Explain Everything, Rashawn Richards, was kind enough to write the forward for, for my book, Formative Tech. Um, and let me share all sorts of pictures um, from Explain Everything within the book. Um, just a powerful, powerful tool, um, traditionally, you know, from our iPad Ed classrooms, but also available on Chromebook and, and other tablets too. And so what a screencast can do is it can give you um, the power of, of listening into student voices, like we mentioned with the other tools. But what it can also do is it can give you a picture of what students are, are working and thinking as they say, draw a diagram, create a tutorial, solve that math problem, highlight a passage, fill in a graphic organizer. Um, a phrase I use all the time is uh, tasks before apps. And you know, the idea there just being like, right, what is it you want students to do? <laughs> Forget about the app for a second, right? And so what a screencast will do is you will have a white space, you will press play and you can draw all over the screen and record your voice at the same time. And what that does is it creates a video. So it captures a video of what happened on your screen. Maybe it was pointing towards the core of the earth or maybe it was um, going through along the steps of a long division problem or maybe it was highlighting uh, keywords as you move through a passage. You create a video that shows the audio, or I should say it shows the movement and captures the audio and puts it all into one video. So you might say to students, I want you to draw a diagram of the parts of a flower and label them. So your students might draw a diagram, right, color it in, um, and then press play, and as they point to each part of their diagram, they can explain the different parts of the flower and what they know about it very different than them filling in and labeling on a worksheet and handing it into you. This is your way to really hear them as they go through. And there's a, a handful of great screencasting tools, but explain everything. I think for me, you know, hands down is just the most powerful one. Um, there's so much you can do with it. We're just scratching the surface today um, when it comes to using this really awesome tool. Another thing that you can do with technology tools when you are looking in and peeking in on student work um, is provide feedback. So gathering data, right, in the ways that we've been talking about so far, checking for understanding, right, and seeing who's got it so you can make, um, uh, just make a decision about what to do next is all very important. But part of this formative assessment cycle, if you will, is providing feedback to students, right? I, I see what you're, you're doing, this is what I noticed, let's keep moving forward, right? So there's lots of ways to provide feedback in a quick and, and timely manner um, with technology tools. 
Um, one of my favorites, of course, is with you know doc integration. And here you'll see Convenda, which is a tool that can be used to give audio feedback, can be used for um, comments and text on the side, lots of different options. You'll see some similar features when you jump into, say, Google Docs or Google Slides. This ability to peek in on student work is an important part of um, formatively assessing students, figuring out where they are and making a decision about what they need to move forward. And so what I love about these type of tools is that it makes feedback more timely and more purposeful. So not only are, am I going in and, and looking at student work, but they can see my responses in a much more timely manner. So yes, um, you know, and I think back to the times where I was putting a post-it note with a, a, you know, a glow and a grow or a next step for students, and the amount of time it would take for that to go from you know, their desk to my desk and back to their desk, you know, a lot was lost um, of time in that process, right? How much are they really going to um, be able to work off of that if they don't see it in a, in a timely manner? And even with our best intentions when working with print resources, you know, there's still some of that breakdown in terms of time. So using, um, having students that are working on digital tools receive feedback from you within those digital tools can be really powerful. And, you know, it could happen in a, a doc setup like you see here. It could also happen in um, in a discussion thread or in an LMS as well, right? That checking in, um, giving feedback so students can use that information and apply it to their learning um, moving forward. The eighth tip on our list um, is all about embedding formative assessment in instruction. So how can you make that happen seamlessly? So in the middle of a lesson, how will you know that students are on the right pathway or mastering content and so on and so forth? And one of my favorite tools to make this happen is Nearpod. Now, Nearpod is a tool, I've been out of the classroom for a couple of years now, um, working with teachers and, and writing about um, all of this work, um, but Nearpod is one that I use one-on-one -on -one with my students all the time. And when it first came out, and now we're talking about, you know, a number of years ago, I was just so excited because I could take my old PowerPoint presentations and I could put them into a platform that could then push out to my students. And I was so excited that I could swipe my screen and it would move from one slide to the next, right? But um, Nearpod has come so far. And my use of it is, I mean, I use it constantly when I'm, I'm leading professional development sessions, especially around um, formative assessment. You can embed all sorts of questions into your lesson. So right away, right, I can say, does everyone really understand what biodiversity means? Right, they can type in a sentence, they could draw a picture, they could answer a poll question. Nearpod gives you a lot of different options, um, and it's a way for you to um, check for understanding in the moment, um, embedded in your instruction. So as you're moving through content, as kids are talking about what they see, if they're watching a quick video or trying something out with their partner, you can pause, bring them together, and have them just quickly give you a little bit of information to have them show what they know. What Nearpod does is it lets you lay out your presentation and then plug in these interactive components. For teachers in classrooms with a wide range of needs, you know, you can have some students respond by just drawing a picture, others opening up a text box. This is a tool, you know, Nearpod's being used in kindergarten classrooms, right, all the way up through, through higher ed and professional learning as well. Super dynamic, and the folks at Nearpod um, have done so much just such cool things when it comes to virtual reality, when it comes to um, just pre-made lessons, and of course, you know, lots of curriculums have been transferred over to their platform, so super cool. But for me, what really stands out about this tool and what I love sharing, you know, when I'm working with teachers or, or speaking about um, this work as well, is how you can take what's already happened um, in a lesson and plug in those check for understanding so kids um, you know, are giving you a little bit of information that can help inform the direction of your lesson. So, so far we've talked a lot about ways to really um, get into the minds of your kids, to see what they're thinking, to watch their thought process, to get a quick check and, and find out what they're excited about. But the next part of this is to share your findings, right? If you have found this information, 
and you're making decisions on it, how is this being um, translated to families, right? If you know that your students are, are working um, towards a goal and there are hiccups along the way or lots of mastery so you want to move in another direction, how are you communicating that with, um, with students with, and their families? So when it comes to providing feedback, there's a lot of those tools, you know, built in to different LMS or learning management systems to push that information to children. But when it comes to the family connection, there's more and more tools that really help you connect that work that's happening every day with families. So it's not just the three times a year, twice a year that you're having a parent-teacher conference or a note home and not as quality of a conversation as you would want to, you can really keep families in the loop using um, technology tools. So there's a lot of great parent communication tools, and, and one I mentioned earlier that has an awesome parent component is Seesaw. And what I like about Seesaw is you can kind of turn this on or off, right? You might just use Seesaw the way I mentioned it earlier for having kids capture their voice and explain their thinking, or you might layer on this extra component where parents can check in, they can see the work that their students are, are doing in classroom, they can see comments on that work, and, and have a journal at their fingertips. So this might be something that you're interested in using to help connect the work in your classroom, all that formative assessment data you're collecting with families. It's a nice way to keep them in the loop, but also um, just make sure that they have a, a full picture of what's going on in your classroom. So the last tip I want to share with you and, and linger on for a moment is this idea of starting small. So over the course of, of just, you know, a bit of our morning together, you know, I've shared a, a lot of different ways that you can bring in digital tools to check for understanding. And so something I think that is so important, especially when I do the list of, you know, 30 favorites or 15 this or 10 that, um, what I like about, you know, sharing a, a handful of things is that it's just your, it's all about you right now, right? What is it that you want to do to get started? You know what your kids um, are excited about, right? You know what they need. You know your teaching style, what devices you have access to regularly, right? All of those logistical pieces, um, the pieces you're passionate about, the parts that um, connect to your curriculum, that's specific to you. So you need to figure out where you want to start, right? Do you want to try out a KWL, you know, just one day um, at the beginning of that first lesson to peek into your students' understanding and, and notice their misconceptions, right? Doing that one thing, which might seem like a little blip over the course of the school year, is huge, right? Bringing that into the start of a unit can not only build confidence when it comes to technology integration for yourself, um, but also kind of gets your kids started with thinking about the way they are interacting with tools in this way. You might decide that you're already, um, you know, you have just a Dropbox folder or full of old PowerPoint presentations, or you have a Google Drive full of slide presentations, and you want to say, you know what, I'm just going to put this into Nearpod and embed a couple activities and it'll be a little bit of a jump from what I normally do, but the content is there, I've already started, you know, I'm good to go. So for all of these components, it's really figuring out, you know, what you want to add to your tool belt. You know, and as you build this tool belt, not just of a favorite online resources, but the ways in which you use them, right, starting with just one or two, right, if it fits, awesome, it works with your teaching style, fantastic, if your kids respond to it, wonderful, right, keep that in your tool belt and pick up two more the next month. And, you know, if something's not working, push it aside because there's lots of different ways that you can really be thoughtful um, about bringing um, technology into your instruction. So I hope that the tips that, you know, I shared with you and, you know, I'm excited to kind of take your questions and, and dive into those pieces um, have been useful, All right? I really believe that with the thoughtful integration of technology tools, you can take the best practices you've already instituted into your classroom um, to the next level and really make this a more meaningful, sustainable, and, and scalable um, integration of digital tools to check for understanding, you know, every day um, during different parts of your lessons.
So I don't know if there's any questions or, or things that um, we can talk about together. Um, I can peek into the chat area or if um, one of our moderators wants to kind of shout out some things that came up so we can make sure um, I address those pieces. Yes, Monica, I did capture some questions as we went. Some were answered in the chat. Uh, KWL, with the KWL chart, do you use this with with students? You mentioned yeah. that at the end. Yeah, so the KWL chart, um, and I know I brought in Padlet early on um, as a, I think was our first example to so find the baseline. That's a way for you to figure out, you know, what do you already know? Um, when you're asking your students, right, what do you know about ecosystems? What do you know about environmental stewardship? Right, you're not only figuring out what they actually do know, but it's also telling you what they think they know about something. So you can handle any misconceptions. You can address those pieces early on in the unit and move your students in um, in a particular direction. Sure. Okay. Um. This one goes with clickers. Does anyone know if there's a quicker way to post questions in the queue, or is it just one by one? For clickers specifically, I'm not sure if there is a, a quicker way to do that. There might be someone who's a super user um, on the call today that could jump in to, to mention that. But that's one of my favorites to share, especially for those of us um, right, if you feel, are feeling a little frustrated like the technology is not working all the time or we don't have a device for everyone. It's a great way to, to bring in those pieces um, mm -hmm. into your classroom. Any place to find the differences, strengths, or features between Nearpod and Pear Deck? Oh, it's so interesting that you brought that up because I've been in a couple different, um, working with some different teachers recently who have um, been using Pear Deck because mm -hmm. it's part of um, like their Google Classroom integration, so it's already you know part of what they're doing. Um, when it comes to the virtual reality component. Um, which we didn't touch upon today, you know, that's really a, a standout with Nearpod and, and something special that they're doing with this 360 video, whether you have headsets with your kids or not. So that's one really big difference. Mm -hmm. um, I also find that some of the interactive components like the, you know, the 3D models that kids can move around their screen, um, the draw it um, option, you know, I just I think those stand out a little bit more. Um, but some of the fundamentals that we talked about today with moving students through a presentation, having things a bit more interactive, um, there are similarities between the two. Okay, thanks. Um, was the one you mentioned in providing feedback Kzena, K A I Z E N A, is that a Chrome extension? So I think they have both a Chrome extension okay. as well as its own um, standalone on the web mm -hmm. too. I can double check on that one. Um, yeah, but that's one that's in, oh, awesome. Um, and that's one that's great because it's, it's heavy on the voice. So you can make sure that you are um, really able to get to a lot more comments than you might be able to if you were typing and responsive all the time. Mm -hmm. You can just record your voice in and put a comment on there. And there's some other tools that do that similarly um, when you're in a a shared doc environment as well. Mm -hmm. Great. What are some ways you incorporate formative assessment into grading? So if you are collecting um, this information, you can pick and choose and say, right, why am I checking or pulling the room for this? And it might be because you want to um, get some, some numbers, right, that you're then going to report you're going to put onto a progress report or, or share with students as kind of an 8 out of 10, right? So if you are looking to give that kind of multiple choice quiz or short response, you can do it very easily um, with tools like Google Classroom or, or any of the others that um, are collecting that data and, and putting it all in one place. Um, but it just comes down to what it is you're looking for. So knowing your um, learning objective, using that success criteria to help you figure out if students got it or didn't get it. That might just be used internally for you and for students on your kind of instructional pathway, or it might be a, a number that you're collecting because you are you know, submitting data in a way that would be a little bit more meaningful for, for other people who are checking in in that work as well. It really just comes down to the purpose for it. Great. 
Thanks. Uh, those were the questions that I was able to capture that were not answered during the presentation today. Uh, does anyone else have any question for for Monica? You can type it in the chat. Okay, I, I think that wraps up the questions. Thanks so much, Monica, for oh, presenting to us today. Thank you so much for having me. Um, just really honored to come and, and share some things that you know I'm excited about. And I hope mm -hmm. that folks uh, keep in touch. And if you have a favorite um, way to, to integrate a, a tool I shared or to check for understanding, I hope you'll give that, that ping on Twitter um, and say hello as well. Great. Thanks so much again. Our upcoming shows are on this slide next Saturday, February 11th, is Jason Nafer, Internet Privacy, February 18th, Steve Sherman, Living Mats, South Africa, February 25th, Brad Spirison, Participate Update. There's no show on March 4th for the 2017 Global Student Conference, STEM and Entrepreneurship. March 11th, we're going to have Jennifer Wagner, Projects by Jen, and hashtag, I'm not quite sure what that hashtag is. March 18th, we're going to have Blooms for Parent Communication, March 25th, Diane De La Costa, Children's Author, April 1st, Desiree Alexander, Not Your Grandmother's Video. And April 8th, Adam Bello with Breakout EDU. So lots and lots of shows coming in the next few weeks. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's latest. He's gathered all of his PD resources in one place, including host your own webinar, where you can sign up for Blackboard Collaborate session. And as long as it's uh, public, it's a free session. You can nominate a featured teacher at this URL. Uh, it's also the, the place to nominate a featured teacher. The form's also in the live binder in the Classroom 2.0 Live Resources tab. The video collection is on iTunes U, and it's accessible in the resources in the live binder. And you can also complete a survey about the presentation. Here is the direct Google form, or you can take the link in the chat box. You can also get to it from the live binder. Once you complete the survey, at the bottom you can request a professional development certificate. It now prints out your name, thanks to Patty Ruffing. Make sure you have this sent to a personal email address. Schools tend to block these from getting to you. Special thanks again to Monica Burns, our special guest, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education, and the Learning Revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in the show. Thanks so much for coming today. <laughs>